We have all been told that good health begins with three things. Eating a balanced diet, exercising regularly, and sleeping well. But I suspect that while most of us do our best to eat properly and exercise regularly, we are not as disciplined when it comes to sleeping well. Hi, I'm Dinesh Balasingham, and welcome to another episode of On The Pulse. And in this episode, I'll be looking into sleep apnea, the danger it poses, and some of its treatments. I'll check out a special pillow that might help snorers like me sleep better. And I'll be learning how good slumber is crucial to our spine health. Many of us know that we should clock at least seven hours of sleep a day, but four in 10 Singaporeans are not doing it. I'm one of them. Six hours of sleep is my daily average, even though I know I might be shortchanging myself of some crucial health benefits. Enough sleep is essential because when we sleep, our body and brain are actually working hard. Our brain clears out toxic byproducts from the central nervous system, which has built up throughout the day and processes new information we gained into long-term memories. Meanwhile, our body releases growth hormones that repair damaged cells and produces infection-fighting antibodies to strengthen our immune system. Poor sleep in the long run can lead to serious health problems affecting your heart, kidneys, blood, brain and mental health. Most times, our lack of sleep is caused by our own choices. Whether scrolling through social media or staying up late to binge watch the latest TV series, we are willingly sacrificing sleep. But for many people, getting enough sleep can be a real challenge due to medical conditions or sleep disorders. There are many sleep disorders, with obstructive sleep apnea being one of the most common. The word apnea means not breathing in Greek. And in Singapore, it's estimated that one in three adults may suffer from moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. But what causes sleep apnea? Breaking it down for us is Dr. Liao Leong Chai, Director of the Sleep Disorders Unit at Singapore General Hospital. So obstructive sleep apnea, or OSA in short, is a condition whereby there is repeated interruption to a patient's breathing during sleep. So what happens when we sleep is when we breathe, air goes through our nose or sometimes our mouth, through our upper airways and then down into our lung. Now, the upper airway has no bones to hold it open. It's usually held open by some muscles and when we go to sleep, the airway muscles are relaxed and this can lead to a narrowing of the airway which can interfere with airflow going down into the lungs. This can be severe enough to cause their oxygen levels to drop repeatedly during the night, sometimes it can happen many, many times an hour, up to 30 or 60 or even 100 times every hour. And what are some classic symptoms of OSA? Common symptoms of OSA are things like loud snoring, or sometimes bed partners would notice the patients seem to gasp or choke at night when they're sleeping. Mm. And it's very common for OSA patients to wake up in the morning and say that they felt like they haven't slept at all. You mentioned snoring, and I've been told that I snore a lot. Does that mean that I have OSA? A snoring is very common. More than 50% of uh, all people snore. Mm. But patients with OSA tend to snore very loudly. Uh, often we are told that these patients can be heard from the other room, or they snore like a train. Most of the time, patients with sleep apnea are not aware that they are suffering from this condition. Uh, quite often, it's their bed partners that drag them in. They will undergo a sleep test, it's an overnight polysomnography, where patients spend the night in the hospital on one of these beds. They'll be wired up with a lot of sensors that are attached to their head, their face, their chest and their body. Let me show you an example of an overnight polysomnography report for a patient with severe OSA. The three key features of obstructive sleep apnea are number one, there's frequent drops in the patient's oxygen level which is represented by this line here. For a normal patient, the oxygen level should be close to 100%, but in a patient with sleep apnea, there can be repeated dips in the oxygen level, sometimes down to as low as 60% that you can see here. We can also see that uh, the sleep quality has been affected. There is a lot of sleep fragmentation, which is represented by these colours that are being broken up, as opposed to a solid chunk of deep sleep. 
which is represented here. And this part here, this is uh, just a simple count of the number of obstructive episodes, each line representing one episode. And this totals up to, uh, on average, for this particular patient, 60 times an hour of uh, sleep interruption. So this patient, we can tell that he has severe obstructive sleep apnea. And that sounds very dangerous as well. Now, mm. are there individuals who are more predisposed to having it, or maybe there are some risk factors involved? The most common risk factor that we encounter is being overweight or obese. The increased uh, amount of fat tissue in their airway and in their tongue and this leads to increased narrowing of their airway and so they're more likely to get airway obstruction when they sleep. The male sex uh, also tend to have increased prevalence of sleep apnea for reasons which are still unclear to us. Aging is another common risk factor. The airway muscles that keep the airways open become less strong. And another contributing factor is the patient's anatomy. So some patients are naturally born uh, with smaller jaws or recessed chin, which uh, leads to a narrowing of the airway. Some races are more prone to obstructive sleep apnea for this reason as, as well. For example, Chinese people tend to have smaller jaws and uh, recessed chin and overall a flatter face. So from the side, you can see that compared to an Indian or Caucasian patient, this part of the airway uh, is much more posterior and we think that that's why Chinese people tend to have a higher risk of having obstructive sleep apnea. What are the treatment options available for those who suffer from OSA? So for patients with milder forms of sleep apnea, losing weight will certainly help, mm. as well as trying to sleep on their side as much as possible instead of lying flat on their back. If their sleep apnea is more severe, then we have a whole range of options. So this can range from an oral appliance such as this. This is called a mandibular advancement splint. And it is custom made to fit the patient's upper and lower teeth. And it has these two little uh, pillars that help to pull your bottom jaw forward. And by doing so, it increases the space at the mm. back of the throat and uh, can relieve the airway obstruction. And it's quite effective in some patients. So the other option that we have, and this is the most uh, widely used treatment in SGH, and it is the most effective option. This is a CPAP machine. It stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure Therapy. It is an air pump with a built-in humidifier. It's connected to the patient via a flexible hose and an interface. Now, this is a nasal pillow interface. So the patient wears this inside their nostril. The air pressure will uh, open up the patient's airway to relieve any snoring or obstructive sleep apnea. Some patients can't use this, for example, if they are mouth breathers or if their nose is always blocked, and they may need to use a bigger mask like this one. Well, while this might be the gold standard, it seems pretty daunting to have this strapped on all night long. It can be quite troublesome for some patients, and we see that with our own data. About 30 to 50% of our patients are unable to use CPAP long term because of the discomfort of uh, using this therapy. Dr. Liao then told me that there is now a more promising solution. But the bad news, it involves surgery. Dr. Sean Lo is one of the first to perform the surgery in Singapore. So far, our treatment strategies have focused on either using a CPAP machine or surgery to try to reconstruct or reconfigure the airway, but none of this treatment strategies have been able to address the lack of muscle tone that occurs in these patients. Upper airway stimulation allows us to directly stimulate the muscles of the upper airway so that tongue protrusion can occur. When the tongue protrudes forwards, it brings the soft palate along with it and this allows normal breathing to resume. With an implanted device, patients can turn this device on and it sends gentlest impulses of electricity to the nerve that controls the tongue to stabilise the airway during sleep. And I see that, is that the device you're speaking on? Yes. This is a pulse generator, and the purpose of the pulse generator is to monitor the patient's breathing continuously through the night and also to send electrical impulses to the tongue in tune with the patient's breathing pattern. So this device is implanted in the patient's chest under general anesthesia through a 5cm cut over here. We also make a small cut in the patient's upper neck. The purpose of this cut in the upper neck is to find the hypoglossal nerve, which is the nerve that controls tongue movement. Once we find the nerve, we completely isolate the branches of the nerve that cause the tongue to protrude forwards. We put a cuff around these branches and we connect a wire under the patient's skin to this pulse generator. So does that mean that once it's implanted, patients can breathe normally again? We allow complete 
healing to take place first. So about one month after surgery, we bring the patients back into the clinic and we switch on this device. There are specific settings on this device with regards to the pattern of stimulation and the voltage of stimulation that can be adjusted with a handheld tablet. Subsequently, after that clinic visit, these patients are encouraged to gradually increase the stimulation voltage to a level that they are comfortable with and that they find effective. So how many patients have undergone this procedure and what has the feedback been? So we started offering this procedure in June last year. By the end of the first quarter this year, we have done about 20 patients. So far, the response from the patients that we've implanted have been good, mainly because these patients were previously struggling with the other various treatment strategies for their OSA and also because the surgery for this device has minimal downtime and minimal pain. So this all sounds very promising, but what happens if they decide to leave their sleep apnea untreated? Every night with untreated OSA, the airway blocks up and the brain has to wake the patient up just enough so that normal breathing can resume. This cycle then repeats multiple times through the night, which increases blood pressure at night, increases the heart rate, and overall increases the stress on the whole body. This has been shown in many medical studies to increase the risk of high blood pressure, irregular heartbeat, cardiac disease, as well as stroke. Many people may think snoring is just a nuisance, but when it comes to obstructive sleep apnea, it could be affecting your overall well-being in very serious ways. Well, I think it's time I take my own snoring seriously and see what I can do about it. Up next, something to help snorers sleep better. Having learnt about the dangers of sleep apnea, I'm definitely a little bit more paranoid about my snoring, but I'm not ready to turn to a CPAP machine or surgery. I wonder if there's something simpler I could try. As it turns out, there is. Funded by the NUS Graduate Research Innovation Program, MI Cloud is a local startup that has launched a pillow that is meant to help us snorers sleep better. Zaid Khan is the CEO and co-founder. Can you tell me more about your pillow and how it works? Over the past one year, we've talked to many doctors in Singapore and outside Singapore. And we've got to know that the major reason for snoring and sleep apnea is the soft palate relaxing when we sleep. So we have a novel magnetic interference technology and uh, it emits a special kind of magnetic field, which we call a magnetic interference cloud, which helps to improve blood circulation in the palate and tone up the palate muscle, reducing snoring and sleep apnea. And this is done through these little nodules itself? Yes, correct. So uh, these magnetic devices will be placed behind your neck. They emit a magnetic interference field, which impacts the properties of water by improving the intermolecular strength of water molecules. Intermolecular strength refers to the electromagnetic force binding molecules together. Zaid explained that the magnetic interference from the devices strengthens the binding forces between the water molecules found in our cells. Our cells contain 60 to 70 percent water and our arteries are made up of cells. When the intermolecular forces in the water increases, the same effect is replicated in the cells as well. The cells tighten up and as a result the arterial wall tightens up as well. It increases the diameter of the vessels and allows the blood to flow more freely. But does the device itself impact the blood? So this one will not impact blood itself because to impact blood, according to research, you need at least 14,000 gauze of magnetic strength. But this one only has less than 1,000. Would you like to try? Sure thing. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the common methods that we use to relate to blood circulation is thermal infrared imaging. Like you can see your imaging right now, it's mostly yellow and green color. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to place the device behind your neck and you'll notice that within a few minutes, the blood circulation will improve, which is indicated by the change in color uh, in the thermal imager. And what will the difference that I will see on the, on the monitor? So on the monitor, you will notice more red color around okay. your neck area, especially the throat area. And that's the improved blood circulation that's happening? Correct, that's okay. the improved blood circulation in the palate. Now you can see that the color in the thermal imaging has changed from more yellow and green to more red. I can see the difference, but I can't say I feel any different. Correct. You won't feel any difference because the magnetic strength is very low. And also the change in temperature that you're seeing in the thermal imaging, it's very small. 
around 0 0.7 to 1.4 degrees to the maximum. Right. The major advantage of our product is that it does not cause any disturbance, unlike the current solutions for sleep apnea and snoring. But I have to emphasize that it's not meant to cure sleep apnea, it's only meant to alleviate mild sleep apnea and reduce snoring. Well, I may not have felt the one degree temperature change that Zaid mentioned, but the infrared thermal imaging definitely showed a difference. And I was assured that the tiny increase in temperature indicated improved blood circulation and not a fever. Okay, so I hear you recently launched your product? Yes, we've recently launched in Singapore through our distributor. We're also launching this year in the APEC market. In the past one year, we've also been testing with a big European sleep wellness company. They tested for loud snoring and sleep quality. And they observed up to 70% improvement in both these scenarios. It's great to see Singapore products like these being introduced overseas. And hopefully it will help snorers like me sleep better. Next up, what sleep can do for your spine. Long hours seated at the desk. Most of us have had to deal with that. And most of us have had to deal with the resulting backache. It's no surprise that a good night's sleep definitely helps with the pain. But do we know why? Well, who better to ask than an expert? Dr. Jenny Lee is a chiropractor who specializes in spinal health and has cracked many a spine in the 12 years of her practice. So back aches and sleep, what's the deal there? Before we talk about that, let's talk about spinal health. Okay. Okay. The so spine is one of the most important part of our body. Your body is kind of like a house. The spine is kind of like a frame of house, the foundation of house. It protects one of the most important part of our central nervous system, which is the spinal cord. There's spinal nerve exiting from the spine, and the spinal nerves goes to every single tissue in your body, down to your fingertips. Wow. Okay. Pretty important. important. Very yes. important. So it's kind of like armor to your spinal cord, right? Okay, so let's talk about what a good spine looks like and what a not so good spine looks like. Okay. okay. So I got my model here. Very real life model. Yes. Which will help you with that. Yeah. So we're looking at the spine from the side. What we want to see is curvatures curvature in the neck, in the chest, in the lower back. And when we turn the spine around, what we want to see is a straight line from top to bottom. Everything is very balanced, everything is straight. So this is what a healthy spine should look like. Obviously, not so healthy spine will be the opposite, the opposite. of that. Yeah. So a lot more curvatures and maybe some bends. Yeah, that will be quite painful. Or decreased curvatures or less curvatures when we're looking from the side. Right. But how does sleep, or the lack of it, impact the spine? Sleep is actually very important for the spine, but many people overlook that. Mm. Imagine your body is kind of like the MRT station we have, right? In the evening, that's the time the engineering and the workers go into the train station to the track to check and repair. Right. That's exactly what happened to your body, to your spine during When you're sleep. sleeping. So we're going to put him in the sleeping position. So during your sleep is the time your body regenerate tissues, replenish, even rehydrate a part of the spine. Rehydrate. Yeah. But does that mean that there's actually fluid? Because to me, the spine is all bone. Spine is a much more complex than just bones. Okay, let me show you. This is a vertebrate and this is a vertebrate. In between is the spinal disc. Inside there's a lot of fluid, a lot of collagen, and then what it does is serve as a shock absorber. So basically when you stand up, it absorbs shocks and maintain the spinal integrity, but most importantly is to preserve the joints. So as the day progress, you know, when we stand up, running, walking around, there's a lot of pressure going to the spinal disc. So we are kind of losing that hydration throughout the day. So by the end of the day, the spinal disc can go a little bit flatter. So when we sleep, the spinal disc takes the opportunity to rehydrate itself, so it becomes a little bit fuller. So that's why in some cases, you can be about one or two cm taller in the morning. 
I think if you told most people that they would take sleep a lot more seriously, me included, sure, one to two sure. cm is quite a bit for some people. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But what happens when the discs flatten? Because that sounds pretty scary to me. All right, let me show you. In my hand, I have uh, two joints. One is healthy, one not so much. This one has a full spinal disc, this one doesn't really have much. So when you lose that hydration in the spinal disc, you lose the ability to preserve joints. Mm. So your joint get degenerated, wear and tear happen a lot faster, the height of the bone decreases as well, and that still ends up with not so good looking spine. Mm. Sleep also reduces inflammation. When we sleep, this is the time our body will take the nutrients to replenish the tissues, such as our disc, or joint, or ligaments, and a certain part of the body can be rehydrated. So sleep is important for the brain, but it's also important for the spine. Well, I didn't know so much is happening to our spine while we sleep. So do you have any tips to help enhance spinal recovery, like this stretching before bed help? Yes, stretching before bed definitely help, but don't exercise, you know, work out, produce endorphin to your body, gets you super excited. Too much endorphin. Exactly, too excited, right? You don't want that. And also just get a little bit of water in your system before you go to bed. Mm. Okay. Speaking of stretching, I can show you this super easy stretching you can do before you go to bed. Okay. Okay. So first of all, you're gonna sit straight up, face forward, and then you're gonna kind of hug yourself. We call this a bear hug stretch. Okay. okay. When you're hugging yourself, you kind of feel a little bit stretch in your upper back. Mm. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna tuck your chin down and slowly extend your neck back and feel that stretch in your neck. Ah. And then you're gonna bring back to neutral position. And then we're gonna do this about 10 to 15 times before you go to bed. Okay, great for isolating the spine. I feel the stretch and yes. also good for single people like me who want a little bit of comfort <laughs> before going to bed. Yeah, a little love. <laughs> a little love yeah, before going to bed. Yeah. Okay. okay. It's really quite amazing how much sleep can impact our health. So tonight, I'm going to be putting away my phone and TV remote and make sure I get enough of that sweet, sweet slumber. Good night. <laughs>